when you were born, your needs were very simple. You probably spent a lot of time wrapped in a blanket, being held by your parents, and maybe you slept in a basket or a bassinet. Your diet consisted either of milk from your mother or formula from a bottle. But you didn't stay that way for long. You grew and you needed more space, you needed to crawl, you wanted to explore, and your diet became a bit more varied. Fish are just like us in that respect. If you remember a few weeks ago, we had baby fish, Alevin, and they had a big yolk sack attached to their belly. And that was all they needed, that and maybe a place in the rocks to hide. But now the fish are free swimming, and we're gonna look today at what fish need to survive as they grow from little Alevin into fry and maybe even touch upon what they're gonna need when they become adult fish. I'm Ethan Rotman. I coordinate the Classroom Aquarium Education Program for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we've got some really great things planned for you today. If you remember, just a few weeks ago, we watched as the eggs were put into our fish tank. We're going to see what they look like today, five weeks later. We're then going to explore not one, but two rivers to look to see what natural habitat would look like for fry that are about five weeks old. We're going to go first to the American River right outside of Sacramento, then to the Russian River right outside Santa Rosa. And we're going to finish off our day, as we always do, answering questions sent to us by students like you. Ready for a fun time? Hey, Tom, are you ready for us? I'm ready for you, Ethan, and thanks for the introduction. Welcome to Tank Time with Tom. It's been five weeks since we put steelhead eggs into the tank, and we've seen some evolve through the last couple weeks from, from egg to alevin and now into fry. And I am happy to say that we have healthy steelhead fry. We have a lot of them. And if you've been watching the video cam, you've seen some of their behavior. Well, this week we're gonna discuss the habitat and what we've done in the tank to mimic the habitat that these steelhead have in the wild. So let's go ahead and take a look and get a closer view into what's going on in the tank. So we're in front of the tank now and I'm gonna scoot around to the side so we can get a better view of what's going on inside. But as I mentioned, we're gonna discuss what we've done here to imitate the habitat that these steelhead have in the wild. And one of the biggest things is their shelter. And you can see here that we've got some rocks so they can hide. A lot of them are actually behind the rocks, but look how, look how many are, are out just swimming about. And they don't have many things to worry about here. There's not any big fish or, or birds that can come swoop in and, uh, and gobble them up. So they're, they're swimming freely, but they're still instinctively hiding. There's some behind the rocks and some underneath the rocks. So that's a big component is providing shelter in here. Uh, having cold, clean water is a really important factor. And as we talked about earlier, we've got a, a digital thermometer in the back there and our temperature has been hovering between 50 and 55, which is pretty good. That's just right, right in there for uh, healthy uh, egg growth. And as we mentioned earlier, the warmer the temperature, the faster the eggs will, will hatch. And the fish will also grow a little bit faster in warmer water. We've got lights on here during the day so that we can see them, but they're only on from 10 to four. And otherwise it's pretty dark in here because we've got the covering on the tank from all the styrofoam. You can see I've taken the front off, but you know, we've got styrofoam covering the sides, the bottom and the top and the back. So that offers insulation and it also provides, provides shade. So it mimics what's going on in the, in the real world. Oxygen is a big one, and I don't know if you can tell, but in the back, there's you can see some bubbles coming in. There's actually a pump, and there's a bunch of bubbles floating around there. But oxygen is a huge factor. And one of them is that animals living in water use up dissolved oxygen. 
and bacteria take up oxygen as they decompose uh, different materials. So what happens is the dissolved oxygen levels drop in water that contains a lot of dead decomposing material. And it also drops when there's warmer water. So having cold, clean water will hold a lot more oxygen than, than warmer, dirtier water. Um, the aquatic vegetation, we don't have any here, but in the wild there'll be plants which, which actually produce oxygen. They release oxygen into the water during photosynthesis during the day. And at night the plants actually use oxygen for their metabolism as the fish need some oxygen. But the big one is um, the aquatic life and the riparian vegetation that shade the stream. So they'll help to decrease the temperature because of the shade. And as the uh, temperature decreases, the, the dissolved oxygen increases. So there's a, there's a rule in physics, a law called Henry's Law. You might want to check that out as a side note. Okay, very cool stuff. So food is another one we've talked about. I'm feeding these just a pinch of food, which is in this bag. And I'm giving them just a, like a pea-sized amount of food every couple days. And you can see these guys are actually scooting along and they're eating some of the food that's on the top, which is really cool. See how they're just going up to the surface and they're actually feeding right now, which is pretty neat. They don't have a whole lot to worry about because there's nothing out there to snatch them up. And they've got a really healthy habitat. So we've done a pretty good job of recreating their environment here. All right, let's go ahead back to the front of the tank and I'll tell you what's to come. Thanks a lot. Next, we're going outside, and we're going to talk to Richard, who's on the American River. And he's going to show us what the American River has to offer in terms of habitat for steelhead. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. And here's Richard. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Thanks, Tom. My name is Richard Munoz, and I'm here on the American River, just outside of Sacramento. You guys have seen how the alevin have developed into fry. The steelhead fry, as they grow, they require more stuff. They need more space and food to survive. Just like you and me. I don't know if this is the best spot to see if we could find some fry. So let's go to another spot and I think we just might find some. Okay, so we're exploring where we could find great habitat for these steelhead fry. And maybe we might find some. We're here in the American River, just not far from where we were before. As you can see, we have some shade. We have cool running water. I think we're getting close. Okay, so you guys are in for a treat. I found a great spot that meet the, the needs of Alvin and the needs of fry that are now getting bigger. So they, they need cool water, they need running water, they need shade, all of that is present here. So I did some real serious hunting and I want you to see what we found. Come on, look, you see the fries? Do you see them? So I'm just kidding, obviously, right? Those are not real steelhead fry, but this is what represents a great spot where steelhead fry can grow and find food and find the space that they need so they can continue to grow bigger into the, the next stage of their life cycle. Thank you for exploring with me here on the American River. And as you can see, it's a great spot for steelhead to develop from this, from their reds as an egg to the alvin with great locations for them to hide and develop. And then as they grow bigger and they need space and food to survive, this provides all the needs that they have here in the American River. So we're going to toss it out to the Russian River and you can explore how that river also provides for these needs 
of these dynamic fish. Hi, my name's Justin. Uh, I'm a fisheries biologist for uh, Sonoma Water. And we're out here on Dry Creek, and we're going to talk a little bit about steelhead fry. They moved from where the nest was built, the steelhead red, they moved from that red out to the margins of the stream where it's shallow and slow water. And that slow water is, is easier for them to swim in, so they don't have to spend as much energy swimming against the current. Steelhead fry will start feeding on um, aquatic invertebrates. So I'm going to pick up a rock out of the stream and we'll look at the underneath of this rock and see what's on there. So this rock that I pulled out of the stream has this aquatic invertebrate, which is too, probably too large for a uh, steelhead fry to eat, but there's other smaller ones in here too. And some of these will be drifting in the current and uh, a steelhead could pick them up and, and eat them. And that's what they start to eat at this stage in their life. So I hope that uh, you enjoyed your time out here on Dry Creek with us. Have a good day. Hey everyone, it's time for Ask a Biologist. I'm Shelly Spriggs with Sonoma Water, and this is a turkey vulture. And we're here to read questions submitted by students just like you. Derek Acomb is joining us again today. He's a fisheries biologist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and he knows a lot about fish. Our first question today is from Ziamara at Healdsburg Elementary. Now, Derek, this is a two-part question. So, part one. Can baby salmon see out of its egg? Good to see you again this week, Shelley. And Siamara, thanks for your question. Trout eggs are translucent. That means they let in light, but not distinct shapes. It's unlikely the trout embryo can see more than light and shadows. Eggs in Alevin have a negative phototaxis response to light. That means light causes them to try and move away from the light and seek shelter in the darkness. Eggs exposed to light can hatch earlier, move more, have more abnormalities, and generally have higher mortality. This is one more reason why rainbow trout and steelhead need cold, dark, well-sheltered habitat to grow and thrive. Oh, that makes sense. Thanks, Derek. Here's the second part of Ziamara's question. Ziamara asks, how do the salmon live without oxygen in the water when they're in the ice chest? All right, Siamara, now for your bonus question. When rainbow trout or steelhead eggs are transported to your classroom, they are wrapped in a moist cloth. This cloth not only keeps the eggs hydrated, but it also allows the oxygen to pass through the egg. At some hatcheries, eggs are hatched in a moist air incubator instead of traditional flooded trays. The moist air incubator is a sealed box that has a very fine fog-like mist that keeps the eggs hydrated allows oxygen in, and allows carbon dioxide to leave the egg. Wow, cool. All right, Derek, our last question today comes to us from Nilani at Maddie Washburn Elementary. Nilani asks, what do they eat when they are little? Nilani, thanks for your question. After consuming their yolk sac, alevins become fry and they need to eat right away. These fry eat primary zooplankton. Zooplankton are very small invertebrates that live near the surface of the water. The young trout will swim out from their shelter to grab a tasty morsel and then dart back to cover. Thanks for that great explanation, Derek. That's all the time we have for today. Back to you, Ethan. I hope by now, we can all see how what the fish need to survive today is different than it was a few weeks ago. The question for you to ponder is, what will they need in the coming weeks and months and even years? These are steelhead trout. That means that they're gonna spend part of their life in the river before going out to spend several years in the ocean and ultimately coming right back to these rivers to lay their eggs when they spawn. What do you think they're going to need through those different life stages? Next week, we're going to come back and we're going to look at how people and our actions impact these fish. What is it that we do that can either help them survive or make their habitats a little bit more degraded and make it harder for them to live? 
Now these fish are now five weeks old, a few more weeks and we're gonna be ready to let them go into the river. And here's another thing I'd like you to think about. What wishes do you have for these fish? We're gonna be asking you to create wishes, maybe a poem, maybe a song, maybe artwork, whatever you'd like and send it in. And we will bring that with us to the river when we release the fish. We'll be sending your teacher more information on that. Until then, think about what you need as you continue to grow, how your life is gonna change, and see if you can guess some of the things that you do in your life that really can help keep habitat and water clean. I'm Ethan Rotman, wishing you another great happy week. Thank you.